What's up, y'all? We're on part two of Dolores S. Williams' Sisters in the Wilderness. So we can go ahead with this. And so this is chapter five, which is titled Sisters in the Wilderness and Community Meetings. So it starts off going going into um, a dissection of the wilderness experience and what it consists of. And the wilderness experience can be in black communities and white communities. So it's something that black women have to navigate in both spaces. And she says here that, and, and um, I actually underlined something here. So um, William said, for both Hagar and the African-American women, the wilderness experience meant standing utterly alone in the midst of serious trouble with only God's support to rely upon. And she made all these nuances into what the wilderness experience it can be. It's um, She defined it as the structure was physical. She found that the structure of the wilderness experience was physical isolation of the slave from slave the, from the slave environment, establishing a relation between Jesus and the slave, healing by Jesus, transformation, motivation um, to return to the slave community. So that was the wilderness um, experience uh, for people that are enslaved that were um, enslaved because. Um, there were slaves that um, that were um, that um, reappropriated the Christianity that was put upon them. So they, so you can go into Nat Turner's slave rebellion, like I said, and um, James Cone, um, um, Black Theology of Black Power, about how religion actually be, um, motivated um, slaves to. Go do slave revolts, contribute to slave revolts, rebellions, and um, um, go into abolition movements. So, like the story of Moses and um, freeing pe people from um, Egypt, um, there is pretty much that that um, liberatory interpretation of the Bible. And then there was um, the in order for all these things to happen, there has to be a shift from the European pioneer of thinking. And um, as you know, the European pioneer of thinking is um, capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, and and the ide ideologies that fuel those to um, make them exist. So you have to get, you have to be rid of them in order to, um, um get to the in order to um go go through um resistance struggles and then she was talking about um how the wilderness experience there is a romanticism of the wild of um there was um it's kind of european but it's not really it's most mostly rooted in um african tradition about um how the wilderness experience how one can see the wilderness and how one can um move through the wilderness um it can be a dark place it can be a light place it's it's a it's a very com complex um um state of state of mind um, not just the physical, but also a mental um, solace for people to be in. And then, um, let me see, is there anything else I highlighted here? Like the wilderness experience is, it's not just one thing. It's not a box. It's literally um, of imagination of what, of what um, freedom can look like. It can be... It's just a place where you don't have to worry about your problems, like Hakuna Matata or something like that. So it's a place where you don't have to worry about 
you don't have to think about um, the struggles that society has already placed on you. And that could be the same way through what um, the Black church has been trying to do throughout these throughout um, centuries. So that's what um, Williams came up with, the wilderness experience for people who um, go through it. And it's not just for Black women. It can be people that are... Um, um gender nonconforming it could be people it could be black men it could be people that are in the spectrum of that it's a gender expansive process too so it's not just something that um black cis women um um endure and it could be it can be like a baptism i would say it can be like a baptism like you're it's a rebirth of um the you coming out of that cage and stuff like that so you're not because you're not the same because if you're suppressed and all that stuff you're a different person than if you're um liberated and free and then there was um she talked about this intellectual significance of symbolism and this social significance of symbolism so she's she mainly talking about the Hagger story and how um, it gave people it gave Hagger um, a better sense of herself and her capabilities and her liberation, and it made her um, and she became a symbol of defiance of this Victorian and European structure because she did not because when she eventually won at the end when she um um escaped from Abraham and Sarah she became a a freer woman she became a freer person um she be um she didn't have to um <clears throat> she did not have to be defined by these victorian styles of womanhood which is a thin white cis heterosexual um woman um lifestyle um she pretty much resisted all those restrictions that are put into that are trying to put her into this box when she was with abraham and sarah and now since she escaped and, and um left abraham and sarah she does not have to worry about it anymore so that that's um that's um something that she gained from it. And then let me see if there's anything else. Mm. Oh, this one goes into um go into the Victorian um womanhood, this Eurocentric standards of what white women should be, of women should be. Um um uh, um Williams um quoted um she quoted um some womanist theologians one of them said black feminist theology presented woman's uplift within an evolutionary framework that repeatedly referred to the degraded status of women in ancient civilizations and in contemporary non-christian cultures thus arguing that the standard of womanhood evolved to a higher plane with the spread of christianity this view enhanced the significance of motherhood and domesticity, since mothers were considered the transmitters of culture. Woman's virtue and intelligence within the home measured the level of civilization. So, um, I, pretty much a lot of what Black feminism goes into um, the experiences with Black mothers and um, the care that they they give um, for not even just for. Um, the, um, their community, but also for themselves. So it's a self empowerment and a self determination um, um, ethic that is that Black feminists um, has that um, other feminist ideologies do not have. Um, it's also um, um, focuses on radical honesty and radical love and radical care and. Um, and then um, it's always um, adapting. It adapts to certain things because society is always changing. So we we might have more understandings of what is con of what um, um, goes beyond the gender binary. We might know more about what's um, beyond um, um, 
um, the present structure. So other stuff that can help us um, have this radical imagination that Adrienne Marie Brown um, said that Octavia Butler um, would want us to have. Like it's, it's an Afrofuturist um, perspective with it too. And then, um, and, and talk about how, you know, with um, sexism and, and patriarchy um, implied in the Bible with um, interpretations from the story of, of Eve and pretty much the story of Eve is pretty much the justification for sexism and patriarchy. Like the curse of Ham was the justification for um, racism. Um, it's pretty, it's, um, it's pretty much Williams calling out, um, what does it mean if for, um, uh, for, uh, Eve who is a, who is made a human, um, mistake, <laughs> And, and um we deify and then we this, she's pretty much demeaned right away like it's pretty much telling women need to be put in their place and stuff like that so it's pretty much um the a combat to that narrative about um women um need to be put in their place and then there was the um, Political importance of the symbolism. So the story of Hagar, it can be seen through an intellectual and social angle, but it can also be seen as something as a strategy for survival and resistance. Because um, it's on this page where it talks about um, how we need to resist because um, throughout American history, there's been of violence committed to black communities and it's not considered genocide. There's no, there's barely a term for it. Like we got the Holocaust, we got, um, we have um, all these genocides that are, that are um, the Armenian gen genocide. Um, there's all these, um, reckonings that are, that happen with those um those um examples of violence like there's a like people that are that survive the holocaust there's like reparations for them there's recovery and survival and and um social programs cater to them but when we get, we talk about um black american experiences think about all the race riots that happened, the lynchings, slavery, um, the prison industrial complex, housing discrimination, education discrimination, job um, discrimination, medical discrimination, um, environmental injustice, all, like, like we got no reckonings for all of these things. So, um, so she's pretty much talking about how to live like Hagger. And she's, I think she, she kind of am, pretty much shows like we can recognize the struggles that Jesus was that Jesus faced we also had to put Hagar and that's acknowledge the struggles that she faced cuz she was a survivor of sexual sexual assault and rape um she was a survivor of white feminist violence and um she's a survivor of um economic hardships and now she got to um um uh, be part of a nation so um it, it so it's pretty much a focus on her liberation and how everyone can follow her footsteps and she also talked about how the U united nations never gave into consideration about never charged the united states about how much there's pretty much these acts of genocide committed to against um black americans and how there's an international well there is international solidarity but it's like stuff like the united nations um which you would think would focus on world peace but there are, there's some um, negligence regarding um um anti-black violence and and then after that, um, 
talk about black leadership and she pretty much she pretty much talked about um what the same thing Michelle Wallace was talking about in um these black and civil rights organizations um black male leadership tends to be the one there's been there's a focus on black charismatic male leadership um especially christian like dr king there's malcolm x there's um wb du bois and booker t washington all the it seems like it's it has to be a man that are leading these races when it's been black women that been doing these on the ground work um like ida b wells fannie lou hamer um ella baker um um, Rosa Parks, even though Rosa Parks is mostly famous for the for um, not sitting on the Montgomery bus boycott, for 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 take for not um, being in the back of the bus, um, she was um, a rape and uh, anti. She was a rape, anti rape activist. So um, and she worked for NAACP, but she's more than just that um, mode of resist that act of resistance and. And then um she pretty much talked about um black women's resistance um history. She's talking about the black women that um petitioned to the court, the black women that prison that poisoned their slave owners, the black women that burned buildings, the black women that refused work and put on strikes, um, and the black women that escaped. So there's a lineage of black women that have always been resisting. Um, and, and it's like, if, like, thinking about Black women being one of the most exploited groups in the United States is like, there's no reason for people that are, that tend to be the oppressors, um, not to do those things to, um, save Black women and protect Black women. So, um, let me see, is there another quote that stuck out to me? Nope, that was it for chapter five. So now we're on to um, part two of the entire book, which is the last, it's only two parts. And part two is titled Womanist God Talk. And now we're on chapter six, which was the longest chapter. <laughs> it, it it took a while for me to get into this one. This was, I think this was the part where I say, you probably want to be in theological school to, or um, do some significant pre-reading in order to understand what she's trying to say here. So um, she talked about, so chapter six is titled Woman is God Talk and Black Liberation Theology. So she's pretty much um, comparing the two and, and see what differences they have. And... So she started off with the theological methodology of womanist God talk and pretty much like the story of Hagar and the experiences of slave women and how their experiences um, um, drive, puts attention to the violence and the exploitation that a system that has been put through, that has they've been put through needs to be abolished. And then um, the next um, title, The Bible and um, Black Liberation Theology, she was pretty much talking about, um, she, was pretty, she was talking about um, how we need to look in, look at through um, the Hebrew Bible and address all the 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 arguments that are being presented around there and we need to redefine black liberation theology she feels there's a necessary critiques of the bible portrayal biblical portrayal of violence let me see if i can find that cuz she had an analysis on that um, she said right here, I suggest that African-American theologians should make it clear to the community that this black way of identifying with God solely through the exodus of the Hebrews and Jesus reported words in Luke belongs to the black historical period of American slavery. Apparently, this was the time when God's liberation of the Israelites or the exodus was the subject and predicate of the biblical ideas undergirding African-American Christian theology. Such is not the case today. To build contemporary systematic theology... 
only on the exodus and Luke paradigm is to ignore generations of black history subsequent to slavery. That is to consign the community in the black theological imagination to a kind of historical stalemate that denies the possibility of change with regard to the people's experience of God and with regard to the possibility of God changing in relation to the community. And I really like this um, portion of um, the book. I think this is my favorite portion. And um, we tend, like, like even when the churches I, I attended to, they do this, um, we have a way as a society to use um, the suffering of a person, the violence that a person went through, and we use that as a reason to treat everyone the way they should be treated. Like we're using the, um, this fear politics to do good and not just for the reason that we're existing and living together. We should just interact just for the sake of being in this earth. And I think that's what's that generates the literally American politics right now. Like a lot of it is based on fear. It's based on um, um, unreasoning. It's not based on true authentic science and not based on stuff that are pretty much scientific stuff like that. Like there needs to be, you just should be good to people just because, they're doing they're existing too they should be good too but you can't just be good you can't just be good to a person just because you're afraid of what you're going to do if you're doing bad so and the thing is it it doesn't give room for a human being to be a human being like they're people like you're like a human being isn't just good and bad there's so a lot of good, a lot of bad, like we're not perfect and stuff like that, but we're trying our best to be better members of society and the world. But um, like, I think it's literally the problem with Christianity too, is they're using, they use um, Jesus's crucifixion to, um, to um, be good and stuff like that. So it's not even with just Jesus, but like literally a regular person who passed away. Um, it, it, it's, it's a person's reasoning to do something that's good. And we can't just do something good just for the sake of a, another person's suffering. And if they died, we should just be doing for the sake of living for just for a person. Just do give people what their flowers while they're living, not just when they're dead. So that's what I really liked about um, that um, portion. And then um, she's talking about the differences between um, the Black experience, the wilderness experience, and theological task. Um, and the wilderness experience, as you can tell, it's um, the womanist um, theory that, um, the womanist concept that um, Williams... Um, um, says that people should embrace compared to just simply the black experience. Um, and she talked about how there's um, a, a horizontal encounter versus a vertical encounter. So a horizontal encounter is people, God's children, um, your sisters, your brothers, and um, your community. And the vertical encounter is you and it could be God. It could be you and um, the ancestors. It could be you and um, the universe. Um, it can be because is because we all have the theory of death, of, of um, heaven and hell. So that's pretty much um, the vertical encounter. So um, that's what she was talking about. Um, let me see. 
You know, she said the horizontal encounter, this is the interaction between black and white groups in a socio-historical context. The interaction results in negative and or positive relationships and socio-political situations. Most often the encounter between blacks and whites is described negatively in black liberation theology. From this encounter, suffering has become a characteristic of African-American community life. The vertical encounter, in this category, Black liberation theologians speak of the meeting between God and oppressed people. This meeting not only results in a creating, creation of sustaining and nurturing cultural forms like Black religion, but the oppressed also achieve positive psychological and physical states of freedom and liberation. So the, fir- the vertical encounter, it's also like a mental and a spiritual um, reckoning in the um, in, um, session. So... Um, after that is, um, the, the doctrine and of surrogacy and redemption and how Jesus can be seen as a surrogate the same way that, um, Hagar and black slave women were surrogates because Jesus was a surrogate for our sins. That's pretty much, um, how, um, some um, theologians can interpret it as that. And um, William said, while Cecil Cohn suggests that the God-human encounter conditions Black experience, Jane Diotis Roberts suggests that Black experience is affected by certain transformations of Black consciousness. James Cohn emphasizes a special epistemological process as foundational for the Black experience. Roberts declares that knowledge of the transformations in Black consciousness is vital for understanding God talk in the Black community. He says that theologians can choose how to interpret their Black experience, but they are obligated to show the character of Black consciousness transformed so that the Black person moves from colorblindness to color consciousness and becomes aware of the implications of Black power. So how do we use this theology to um, give us the education and intellectual development that we need? And... And then um, you can do that through womanist theology to give you, enhance your knowledge on how and what should we learn from the experiences that Black women have gone through throughout history. And when it comes to the doctrine of the surrogacy and, um, and of redemption... I didn't highlight anything, man. But <laughs> so it's pretty much talking about um, um, this. This this we all know the story of Jesus. Um, he died for our sins and got crucified and suffered and eventually he lived. He rose from the dead, and that it can be that can be seen as um, a story of liberation because he no longer has to suffer after what he did and. He and before he passed away, people remember him as the rat as a radical. He is a a loving um, person and and is a good um, example of a person that left a legacy that is positive and filled with love. And that's probably what everyone will want to strive for. So so we have to so. That we figure that out through religion, through Christianity. We figure that out through um, politics and science and um, and um, ideas. So that's pretty much the point of it all. Like you have to um, 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 meet, interact with each other, come up with some ideas on how to make society better, and then implement those ideas and see whether those things are working and if they're not um just you have to do an alternative so um that's pretty much the organizing how you should live as an organizer and activist like if you want to generate change and you have to do those those simple steps and those are those those sound easy but struggle is also also going to be there like you it's important to have principled struggle and then um, Williams said, humankind is then redeemed through Jesus's ministerial vision of life and not through his death. There is nothing divine in the blood of the cross. God does not intend black women's surrogacy experience. Neither can Christian faith affirm such an idea. 
Jesus did not come to be a surrogate. Jesus came for life to show humans a perfect vision of ministerial relation that humans had very little knowledge of. As Christians, black women cannot forget the cross, but neither can they glorify it. To do so is to glorify suffering and to render their exploitation sacred. To do so is to glorify the sin of defilement. So yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Not just recognize a person when they die, recognize the times when they were living. And that's that's like a critique that that is interesting in Christianity when you wear the cross or something as a necklace or something because it's like resembles like it resembles the the violence that uh, it 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 reminds people of the violence that Jesus um um suffered, but for some people it's just to remember that a person a person um um took risk he was willing to willing to die for the sake of goodness so that's that's kind of pretty much why everyone should live <laughs> and then um we um go into this next session which is titled re-enter black liberation theology and she's pretty much giving some constructive criticism on black on black liberation theology. She wants um black male liberation the theologians to decenter suffering and redefine incarnation and reconciliation through the cross. And she has this thing called revaluing of value. So it's pretty much another a uh, way of saying um go it's like Sankofa, go back and get it. Just r try to look deep and, criti and critical into uh, what you consume and what you um, learn. And you have to unlearn some things. And then um, the next title was titled um, Ethical Task and Ethical Principles, which pretty much talks about how sh struggles in these movements, they tend to be violent. Um um the mantra of living the christian life and um liberation ethics versus survival and quality of life ethics which i mentioned in the last video how their strategies uh sometimes liberation and survival they intermingle sometimes but they they're not, like they're not mutually exclusive but they are different and sometimes survival will not lead to true liberation and then um i find i find that this this to be nice how she um high, she pretty much acknowledged um black mothers so like sister outsider um audrey lord talked about and um and sister outsider williams talked about how there's um mother outsiders so pretty much tell, never forget like the quote unquote the original mother some people say it was in africa there's the mother earth is was um everyone was born in africa so a black woman so that's pretty much the idea that some some um uh theologians um say um if it wasn't for literally if it wasn't for black women the wor world wouldn't go around and that's true because of the historical not just from that idea but from uh the historical ex the countless ex historical examples of black women um fighting for change and um uh, transformation for a society for a better society and then um let me see um uh, yeah, she says here, theologically, this ethical task of revaluing the value of oppressed motherhood is essential for deriving a woman-inclusive notion of biblical in incarnation and revelation, especially Christian Testament revelation. Um, the notions of incarnation and revelation prevalent in Black liberation theology leave Black women of African slave woman descent in an outsider position in which Paul relegated Hagar in the book of Galatians. Therefore, if the incarnation in and the revelation of God and the oppressed mother is ignored, it is of very little significance to Black women that Black male liberation theologians in the execution of their ethical task of revaluing value connect the revelation of God and Jesus, the oppressed son, with liberation and reconciliation. The conclusion here is that this task of revaluing the value of Black motherhood has important social and theological implications for understanding the character and practice of religion in the African-American community.
All right. So now that's it for chapter six. So we move on to chapter seven, which is titled Womanist Feminist Dialogue Differences and Commonalities. So the last chapter was talking about the differences between womanist theology and black liberation theology. This one's talking about the differences between womanist theology and feminist theology. So the differences are um, what is except. The differences that womanist and feminist dial theolo, theolo, theologies have, er, they talk about um, what is considered female, what is acceptably female, um, the scope and definition of patriarchy and um, hermeneutics and God's relation to the oppressed in history. So when we go into what is acceptably female, I feel like womanism is pretty much talking about is giving room um, beyond the bi the gender binary, and it's not just um, a woman a woman's purity when it comes to um, sexuality or something. This idea of purity for regarding sexuality, which is which comes from a some Asian theologians and womanist theology pretty much gives gives a more um flexible and more autonomous um idea of sexuality. How it's pretty much for it's pretty much like sex sex is something that people should have pleasure for, and it it shouldn't be just it shouldn't be just something that should be um feared and and um, stuff like that. And then um, there's a comp conversation of the scope and definition of patriarchy. So we all know how um, patriarchy comes with so many different levels. There's so many levels to it. It's not even just um, men occupying spaces, but it's also the power that comes with men being in those spaces. Um, the violence that women went through, what are the powers that, the power, the power dynamics that um, men have over um, women in a male-dominated society, whether that's um, um, financial and sexual exploitation and um, stuff like that. And then um, she was talking about um, hermeneutics, which is pretty much another way of saying biblical interpretations. So there's... Um, the the focus on kinship ties and womanist theology there's the afrocentric biblical tradition there's these um variations of survival modalities so it pretty much talks about the experience another I say it again the experience of what black women had to go through whether that's through survival or through liberation and if you did if you never had to go through the liberation strategies you sure did go through some survival strategies to um you probably didn't know you're going for your liberation but you were going for your liberation so it's pretty much tied into how those um are interconnected and and then there's god's relation to the um oppressed in history so she was talking about the relationship to um, Hagar and Ishmael's survival quality of life. And, and then there's a um, human initiated liberation for Hagar when she went to the desert. Because if she did not go to the desert, she was going to be stuck with Abraham and Sarah. And there's no going to be there's no peace, no liberation if you stay with Abraham and Sarah. Because look at how they treated you. How Look how they, the positions and stuff they put you through. So when she went to the desert, she went through her wilderness. She, they, her and Ishmael went through so much stuff, and then they eventually found a community where they can feel safe and um, and empowered. And then um, when we get into the commonalities, the commonalities were pretty much highlighting that sexism exists. Um, we should not look for. We should not have, there should be a decenter of the atonement and suffering as a redemption. We should not just do things for, um, because they're this quote unquote moral um, suasion. And there's an acknowledgement of black women's oppression and their resilience through that, throughout the, uh, that oppression. And let me see if there's a quote that stuck out to me. Mm, there's probably not a quote. 
Oh, there is. Um, William said, while we cannot romanticize it, we cannot forget the influence that African heritage must have exerted upon the African women's slaves um, interpretation of both the Bible and the new culture, American white, into which the slave was thrown with no preparation whatsoever. We can speculate that it was altogether consistent with some African consciousness for African slaves in America to appropriate a female and her child in relation to survival. This is because some of the slaves came from matrilineal cultures where survival and progeny, progeny, progeny were counted throughout the, through the female. And... I think that's it. Oh, no. Another quote. Um, On the basis of the Hager Sarah text, the feminist and womanist liberationists and the womanist survival quality of life advocates may provide different responses to the question, how does God relate to the oppressed in history? The liberationists may say God relates primarily to liberation efforts. The survivalists may say God relates primarily to survival quality of life efforts. Some feminists and womanists may say God relates to the oppressed both ways at different times or at the same time. Again, the issue is not who is right or wrong. The issue is an understanding of biblical accounts about God that allows various communities of poor, oppressed black women and men to hear and see the doing of the good news in a way that is meaningful for their lives. And that pretty much just pretty much closes out with how womanist theology is different from feminist theology and black liberation theology. And now we're on the last chapter of the book. So chapter eight is titled um, Womanist Reflections on the Black Church, the African-American Denominational Churches, and the Universal Hager's Spiritual Church. So um, it starts off um, talking about... um, so it's pretty much womanist and how they feel about the black church and the African American denominational churches, and it talks about the um, the creation of the Universal Hager's spiritual um, church after Hager, named after Hager, and it pretty much talks about the black church um, has been a symbol of hope throughout history. It's where people um, found find um, the haven away from the tortures of slavery and segregation and all the racial injustices that happen in the United States. And then um, she talks she talks about her frustration. She, she had a lot of critiques of the African-American denominational churches, which she feels like they play more in a patriarchal um, lens, patriarchal um, 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 side of things. So there wasn't a lot of women preachers in, in them, these churches, because of the misogyny that they... Um, um, accepted. Um, there was a negligence of the AIDS epidemic. So we all know about how religion and queerness, they, they didn't have the best history, but, um, there was a negligence of AIDS, um, from these churches, even though they're supposed to be safe havens for community, some community empowerment, and they neglect people that went through the AIDS epidemic. And then there was a sexual violence uh, that came from a lot of ministers and preachers, um, the homophobia that are, that's in the church. Um, there wasn't so any support for people that were incarcerated. So it's pretty much um, talking about disposability politics and how people, tr- how the way society treats pe- people that are incarcerated. Sometimes the church imitates societal. Um, ideologies and treats um people that are incarcerated as if they're going to hell anyway because we because people already see hell as like a prison or something as something um to um to be carceral and then um there's this idea of being americanized yeah the william said it is community essence ideal and real as God works through it in behalf of the survival, liberation, and positive productive quality of life of suffering people. So, um, when we go into, um, when we go into Americanized, American culture, and seeing if it's actually worth being Americanized, um, 
She said here, um, both in slavery and shortly after they came out of bondage, African-Americans survived and were welded together as a community by the Black church in solidarity with the mutual aid societies and the Black extended family. But as African-Americans became more and more American Americanized by appropriating white American values of individualism, capitalist economics, and classism, the solidarity between the Black church, the mutual aid societies, and the extended family disappeared. The mainline African-American denominational churches supported the adoption of these white values, and the Black church retreated to the deep recesses of the soul of the community memory. Many mutual aid societies went out of existence or changed to organizations of lesser importance in the economic structure of the African-American denominational churches. Black people were duped into believing that their economic interests could be served by a white-dominated American capitalist economy and capitalist institutions. The Black extended family passed away. Black people, in their effort to be Americanized, began to believe that the white model of the nuclear family could be more adequately service the bonding and the wisdom and transmitting tasks absolutely necessary for the survival of generations of Black people, women, men, and children. Nothing, of course, could have been farther from the truth. Um, in actuality, the old folks, the grandmothers, grandfathers, great aunts and great uncles, the ancestors, were the carriers of the wisdom and traditions effective for survival and community building. The old folks were alienated from the nuclear family structure. They were isolated from black children who needed, along with their patterns, the wisdom of the ancestors. They needed this wisdom in order to learn their strategies in black everyday life, which had worked over time for survival, liberation, and for developing a positive, productive quality of life. So what she's saying here is that as we got into... Got Got immense into being Americanized, we're like going, getting away from our roots. We're getting away from our cultural um, mores and our, and our, and our, um, our natural instincts as people that come from Africa. So it's, um, it's this shying away from community, is this shying away from your language, your history, your, um, your trauma, your, you're pretty much suppressing all of that and you're letting um pretty much you're pretty much seeing like white american capitalism militarism and imperialism as um and colonialism as a legitimate and they and people have to go through life with those things and they shouldn't have to so that's the issue with that and then um there's this um uh, section where um, it's titled um, Where Do We Go From Here? And that came from a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speech. And it's where um, a lot of Black liberation theologians, because he was a Black liberationist, um, they were discussing what do Black people pretty much need. It's pretty much something that happened after um, it's a post-civil rights movement where some preachers came along um, and discussed what what do black people need to be free from racism and anti-black violence? So um, I know Jeremiah Wright was one of the preachers that were that were in these circles. So um, um, right here it said, regardless of these positive features of the African American denominational churches, there are questions about black women to which all the African American denominational churches need to respond. So these are the questions that Williams feel like need to be asked during these meetings. What is being done in the churches to motivate self-love and self-esteem among Black women? How many times does the preacher's sermon have as its subject the oppression prevailing in the Black community, especially the oppression of Black women? How many times does the preacher address the emotional and sexual exploitation of Black women by Black men? How many times has domestic violence been the subject of the sermon? How many times does the sermon advise Black men about being positive and responsible parents to their children? How many times does the preacher's sermon tell Black men to, to erase white aesthetic values from their minds and love and respect black skinned, broad nosed, beautiful black women who look like black women? Are there study groups in the church and outreach programs in the community that are devoted to dealing with these issues? Are there classes on parenting now that are that that there are so many teenage parents? Is the church supporting the kind of parenthood that accommodates the liberation of women and children as well as that of men? How much attention are the denominational churches going to discussions and classes on sexuality so that young people can begin sex education early? How much attention is given to young black women coming to terms early with career goals so that they realize they can have a productive future unburdened by teenage pregnancies? Are teenage parents getting the kind of support they need from their churches? So I think something as 
something that people don't like to talk about something like teenage pregnancy which happens has has been exi- happening in society society as long as you can remember like the church has to come with those answers cuz cuz the way that theology has been teaching it it pretty much saying that teenage parents are going to hell or some and stuff like that so it's you have to go get away from respectability politics you have to get away from um carcerality you have to get away f- from all of those things that are rooted in colonial structures and and uh, solve them and there needs to be resistance rituals which is interesting that because that goes into the next section which is titled universal hager spiritual church um so it talks about the spiritual um because you know there's Baptist churches, there's P- Pentecostal churches, but now we're talking about spiritual churches, which are more attuned with spirituality. So that's when you got um, um, some of it is voodoo, some of it is um, just ancestral on religion. So think the God, are, think God are your ancestors. So um, there um, were a lot of um, churches that were founded by Black women um back then especially in new orleans so this is what i so i didn't learn this until i read this book that there were a lot of um black women that um that created that founded these churches um it's a lot of them like i'm like i'm surprised i never heard of them um until now like it's extensive there's catherine seals there's cj hyde there's uh, Mother L. Crossier, there's um, uh, Claudia Jacobs, there's um, it's just a lot of it's just a lot of people. Like it tells you about the diversity of African um, religion. So it's not even just spirituality. Like there's um, the Orishas, um, where you talk about people like Oshun. Um, um who else um there was a lot of african goddesses and stuff like that a lot a lot of them um originated in egypt and um other parts of africa but um yeah that existed and then there was um the universal hager's um spiritual um churches um association that was founded by george willie hurley so um a lot of them um it was a spiritual church association it was a universal hager's association of spiritual churches that was organized by george willie hurley and this was interesting so he kind of sees himself as like um I don't think he would. I don't think William Sitt would say like he's trying to say he's he sees himself as a god because he was born like last century. Like because he sees because a lot of preachers they feel like they've been they've been they believe that they're um some they've been summoned by God to preach the gospel and stuff like that. But Hurley feels like it's something bigger than that that he feels like God wants him to do. So he created um. Um, this association and he feels like he's the the god of the Aquarian age like he like astrologically speaking there's um a god of the Piscean age there's a god of the um Taurian age so there's these different gods that um Hurley feels like are 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 in so it's kind of like he created his own religion but he it has a lot of um, Christian undertones. I guess it's the same way with um, Christ being a Jew, but we have Christianity. So I guess it's the same way as that because he has um, these followers called Hurleyites. So it's kind of giving. It's kind of makes you. It, it makes me think of the Nation of Islam, which you can argue. Some people argue as a cult, <laughs> but um, it gave people um, opportunities to believe in resistance. Like, I don't think they um, believe in um, Christmas and um, they don't believe that there's 
Um, they believe that they believe that the there's a heaven and a hell, but they feel like there's a hell on earth, which I understand why they believe that. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of leadership of women. There's a presence of women that um, in leadership, and a lot of women that are in leadership roles. And when he passed away, um, his wife took um, took over. And then when she passed away, I think it was just some other people that other people that they got they know that were taking care of the association. But I don't think it's, it's like living long. I feel like it's not a lot of presence in them, the Un Universal Hager Spiritual Association of Churches. So it. It, I think it became big back then, but it's not as huge as it was. And that was it, I think. Yeah, they have they have they have ten commandments. So I'll read the commandments. Um, thou shalt believe in spirit, God within matter. Thou shalt ignore a sky heaven for happiness and a downward hell for human punishment. Thou shalt believe in heaven and hell here on earth. Thou shalt believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Thou shalt believe in what you sow, you shall also reap. Thou shalt believe that the Ethiopians and all nations will rule the world in righteousness. Thou shalt believe that Universal Hager Spiritual Church was revealed to Father G. W. Hurley for the blessing of all nations that believe in him. Thou shalt pray for God to bless your enemies. Thou shalt ask God to give you power to overcome them. Thou shalt believe that our relatives and friends whose spirits have departed from the body are within our own bodies to help us overcome all difficulties in life. So with um, his um, ideas, there's um, there's no box. So it's um, there's no um, conformity, no social conformativity that um, he thinks that should be allowed in um, that um, theology. So that's pretty much what he's been teaching. And I think Williams was trying to signify that's that's pretty much similar to womanist theology. It's probably, probably not saying that he is a god and stuff like that, but um, it's it's um, freeing, it's a, libera it's a liberating, it's putting, giving yourself power is pretty much where you're saying, because there's a God in you that like God is within you. God isn't, if you, uh, if you're vulnerable to allow God in your heart, you're giving him your hit. You're, you're allowing him to give, give you power and the strength to do so many things, whether that's creating, whether that's, um, um, keep taking care of your community or your family, whether that's, um, loving a person and, um, is, is just, you have the power you have power. <laughs> you are your own source of energy that you that you give, and you should give yourself um, the autonomy to do it and the control. You have the control. All right, so that's it for um, Dolores S. Williams, Sisters in the Wilderness. I'm finally glad that I finally got this done um, by the time Women's History Month ended. So. Um, um, I, it's a challenging book. I'm not going to lie, y'all. This was a challenging book. So it was a lot of information that, um, it, it, it'll take a while to sink in. Like you have to reread some of it, some, some reread some of it. And, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's it. So thank y'all for um staying with me for, to read, um, Sisters in the Wilderness. And, um, it might be another while until another put another video because I I'm honestly I read a lot of books y'all <laughs> so um so I'm uh, I'll I'll put up another video soon hopefully before um June um which will be the one year anniversary of this project um but um yeah stay tuned for another um video and um stay tuned for what i'm about to read and i hope y'all take care and look more into womanist theology and womanism in general it's a it's a theory that and concept that everyone should pretty much learn and know about specific especially considering um when society has been treating people that are black women and people that are um people that are um not that don't confide to um the gender binary 
And yeah, so y'all take care and um, make sure y'all follow at Raisin Souls and my personal um, at Intellectual Albert. It'll be on the description box below. So, all right, take care.